What does it mean to be called crazy in a crazy world? Listen to Madness Radio, Voices and Visions from Outside Mental Health. Tuesdays, 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern on Pacifica Affiliates, WXOJLP FM, Northampton, Massachusetts, and KWMD Kasilov and Anchorage, Alaska. Produced by Freedom Center and the Icarus Project, streaming, podcasting, and archive at madnessradio.net. Welcome to Madness Radio. This is your host, Will Hall. And uh, today we have David Lukoff. Um, David is a licensed clinical psychologist. He is a professor of psychology at the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology in Palo Alto, California. And he was the co-author of a category in the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, of Religious or Spiritual Problem. He is a pioneer in the effort to get spiritual emergence issues, spiritual crisis, um, madness, and psychosis experiences that have a spiritual aspect to them recognized by the mental health system. So welcome to Madness Radio, David Lukoff. Okay, well, good to be here, Will. Well, it's, it's really interesting having you on the show because you're an example of someone who is now a practicing professional in the system, but you also had your own personal experiences with a psychiatric or mental health crisis. Is that right? Yes, really that has been uh, the uh, foundation of my subsequent work over the last uh, 35 years uh, on bringing spirituality into clinical practice. It was a uh, episode uh, that uh, certainly would have looked very psychotic uh, to uh, mental health professionals at the time. And um, yet I, I do consider it to be my spiritual awakening and also my um, uh, experiential uh, basis for developing uh, expertise in this area without having any uh, prior education academically in uh, religious history or theology. I'm not a spiritual uh, teacher. Uh, I'm not a minister or a rabbi. Uh, and yet I have become uh, an expert on this area of spirituality and clinical practice. And there are many other experts, for sure. But um, I have about 80 publications in this area and uh, have been you know, uh, one of the, or am one of the uh, co-authors of this uh, category in the DSM-4, which, um, you know, is often called the Bible of mental health because it has to be the codes in the DSM-4 are part of any uh, uh, clinical uh, institutions practice. The uh, ho- all hospitals, uh, all clinics, all hospices and so on uh, are involved in making these kinds of DSM diagnoses. And your work has been very um, successful, and I know that there are some um, there's some recent developments in California that I want to talk to um, you more about, and I want to hear the story about you know getting the um, the diagnosis, the diagnostic category into the DSM. But maybe we can just start by um, you telling us about that crisis that you had, that spiritual awakening experience that you had it, it was it happened when you were quite young is that right uh well it happened when i was uh a graduate student at harvard in social anthropology i was uh 23 years old and um i had just gotten my master's degree and uh, had what I would consider to be an existential crisis of questioning who I was. And here I was at 23, you know, about to embark on uh, the final stages of determining my professional career. And at the time, I was also uh, living with, together with a woman, and we were talking about getting married. And I, I just went through this crisis about uh, having... Uh, so little uh, true life experience. I'd been in school my entire life, Uh, even during summers. uh, I had uh, worked at universities and stuff. And as part of that crisis, I dropped out of Harvard and um, got rid of everything I owned that wouldn't fit into a backpack and started hitchhiking around the United States. Now, David, were you in kind of distress when you were doing this, or was it just more like a coming-of-age kind of thing that you really need to sort of shake up your life or? Well, it was the latter. It really was an existential crisis of questioning uh, who I was and 
what my meaning and purpose in life was at the time. It was kind of, uh, you know, uh, it is common, I would say, of people in their late teens and early 20s to have these kinds of questions about identity and and so on. And you were going pretty fast, it sounds like. 23 is pretty young to be graduating from Yes, I had actually um, uh, gotten into college uh, without graduating high school um, in a program that let people uh, go to college early. I was not very uh, socially uh, integrated in my high school. It was just, I mean, I had some really good friends, but the 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 day-to-day routine of going to high school was a uh, drag. Uh, and so the idea, I was slated for my senior year to take uh, four honors courses and instead decided to take my first year of college at a college. I mean, AP courses. Anyway, at 23, when I had my master's degree, you know, as I say, I, that was it. I had been my life. My, I should also mention my father was a professor, so I grew up in that culture. And even my grandfather, my mother's father, was a um, a rabbi and a professor. He had both uh, full-time jobs going. So there's also kind of like a lot of pressure in the background for success and following your family's footsteps and those kinds of things, I imagine. Yes, and it's, it's kind of funny that now I am in academia, but part of what I was questioning at that age of 23 while I was a graduate student uh, was... Uh, what, you know, do I want to be an academic? Is that really my calling? Or is that just what, you know, I kind of grew up with, you know? So you decided to Uh, drop out of Harvard and then you went on this, um, you got rid of all your possessions and went on this backpacking, um, hitchhiking experience. You know, even though it was 1971, it was really culturally what we call the 60s, you know, it was, uh, um, oh, there was this whole kind of hippie culture and people picked of people, you know, a lot. It was not, you know, there was a whole group of people hitchhiking around the country at the time. Yeah, you weren't the only person, I guess, who had dropped out of Harvard to travel around and, and find yourself, it sounds like, is what you were doing. Uh, I did end up, and was one of my destinations in San Francisco, you know, uh, but, and it, somebody offered me a tab of LSD, and uh, I had kind of been on this uh, theme, you know, even literally listening to the song, you know, over and over again, um, On the Road to Find Out by Cat Stevens. And so I felt like, you know, I was on the road to find out, meet new kinds of people, have new kinds of experiences. So I took the LSD. Did you and, have much sense of what you were kind of in for? Because LSD is, I mean, it's a mixed bag, but for some people it can be extremely powerful <laughs> experience. Well, <clears throat> Ultimately, it was, but when I actually took it, um, I had a, you know, what I would describe as a pleasant experience. And at the end of that day, I, you know, said, "Oh, well, this is kind of interesting." I enjoyed the perceptual, you know, uh, kind of uh, sh- sh- visual show, um, but it didn't seem to have any other effect on me at the time. And then the next day, I woke up and uh, pulled out a book I had been had my backpack and been trying to read and it had not made any sense to me, which was a book by Alan Watts on uh, Zen and Enlightenment. And all of a sudden, it made perfect sense to me, you know, all this stuff about enlightenment, seeing through social games and uh, so on. I mean, it just spoke to me, you know, and I, all of a sudden I started to kind of became a page turner to me. Yeah, I have to say, Alan Watts is really, is very wonderful. I mean, he's a really great writer. If anybody's listening to this and you haven't read Alan Watts. I mean, I don't know how you what you think about him today, but I, I certainly haven't read that particular book. But I've read other Alan Watts, and it's just it is really pretty mind mind blowing writing, actually. Yes, yes, and there's actually a number of free podcasts of his talks that are available on iTunes. Oh yeah, and I think also I, someone told me there's some videos as well. So just you know, Google Alan Watts W A T T S, and you'll you'll go on your own uh, your own journey, I guess. So so you mm. you started reading the book that you've been not really understanding, but after the LSD experience, suddenly it starts making sense to you. And uh, and then w- w- four days after I uh, took the LSD, I woke up in the middle of the night and walked into the bathroom. And uh, as I was walking in, I looked in the mirror, and for some reason I was holding my uh, right hand up in a mudra 
position that you sometimes see the Buddha in, you know, with the thumb and the first four, you know, the forefinger in a circle and other fingers spreading out from that. And um, when I looked at it in the mirror, it was glowing. It was giving off a white light. And uh, immediately I knew what that meant. It meant that I was a reincarnation of Buddha. And and following right on that, uh, I had another uh, insight that I was also the uh, a reincarnation of Christ, and that uh, I had a mission, a new mission, that uh, was to create a world uh, religion that. Uh, Buddha had created a religion for the East, and Christ had created a religion for the West, which also shows how uh, uninformed I was about spirituality at the time, but um, that's how I viewed it, and um, that I was to write the holy book for a new world religion. Now, we should say that um, the the LSD had worn off at this point. I mean, a an acid trip is maybe six, eight hours. So you were you had come down from the LSD, but then something was maybe activated or triggered inside of you that you opened up just yourself without without being under the influence of the drug. Is that is that fair to say? Right, and it, I think it started a chain of thinking beginning with the Alan Watts uh, reading. Because as part of this, uh, I thought of myself as enlightened, like Buddha. You know, and I, I you know, had the sense that I had seen through all of the social games, and now because of that, and because I had studied anthropology at Harvard, and I had studied ancient civilizations at the University of Chicago, that you know I had been prepared to write this new holy book. And I sat down and I started to write in the book that I was carrying around as a, a, a diary, kind of, uh, a new holy book. And I stayed up uh, pretty much over the next five days writing this, uh, you know, getting an hour nap here and an hour nap there, but um, pretty much focused on writing this and having uh, conversations. Uh, and I, they were, were kind of in my mind, but they were conversations with, you know, not only Buddha and Christ, but, you know, people like Socrates and Plato and uh, Rousseau and Locke about, you know, how to, the social contract, you know, how do people live together? And um, also with uh, Margaret Mead about, you know, because of her cross-cultural wisdom. Uh, And also with Bob Dylan and Cat Stevens because of their um, ability to get kind of uh, their perspectives out into the world. I thought, you know, I should have conversations with them, and um, also with Freud and Jung because of their, you know, enhanced understanding or advanced understanding of human psychology. Um, so, now, I, David, you know, this wasn't just uh, something that was happening like when we imagine conversations. You really felt like you were communing with those spirits or having a dialogue exactly. with them, or exactly. Yeah, I really thought I was conversing with them. So it's kind of like a channeling experience, you could you could say. Mm-hmm, 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 yeah. And what was the quality of this? Because I know when sometimes people um, go into states where they feel inspired to give a message to the world or they feel like they are the incarnation of the Buddha or the or the Christ, that it's a very, it can be a very egotistical, kind of like grandiose, like I'm better than everybody else and listen to me, and it's kind of like, high speed, really sort of self-centered. And then other times it can be much more heartful and open and more humble, which I think is really what the teachings are more about, that we're all in some sense the Buddha and we're all in some sense the, the Christ. And how, how was mm-hmm. it for you? Were you really kind of kind of driven in this kind of egotistical way? or? Well, there were certainly elements kind of of both. I mean, there were some ways in which I presume myself to be enlightened, uh, which is certainly a superior state of uh, being. And I also felt uh, kind of entitled in the sense that um, I didn't think I had to worry about money. Um, and I and my friends really were great. They um, let me crash with them and, you know, fed me. And so I, I didn't have any money. Uh, I could have easily kind of ended up in the streets and my... Uh, 
experience could have unfolded in a very different scenario. But uh, what actually happened was that uh, over the next couple of months, well, I should finish t- saying exactly what I did, though. Yeah, but, because uh, you were, you're writing, it sounds like you spent four or five days just writing this great spiritual treatise that you were channeling all these different um, voices and authors from the history from history to help you with. And I came up with this uh, vision, or uh, book, really, uh, and made up 40 copies, and uh, sent off about half of them to uh, friends and relatives of mine, my parents, and so on, and um, distributed the other 20 in the street uh, in Berkeley. I had kind of concluded that Berkeley was the new Jerusalem, it was going to be the new center of the earth from which this uh, uh, new uh, world spirituality would, un- would unfold. Yeah, I did it in front of a, a famous bookstore there. And also, you know, it, the, it's funny, if you go back to that street, it looks just like it did back in, in 1971. There are a lot of people selling you know, tie-dyed T-shirts and uh, handmade jewelry and, and stuff like that. And That's books that they s- stayed up all night writing themselves. <laughs> yeah. I'll was, bet you that somebody else has, yeah. has done that since then. Was it like yes. Moe's or Cody's that you were in front of or something? Cody's, yeah. Cody's, yeah. yeah. Cody's. And then, you know, as I said, that was, I thought I just needed to uh, wait for these books. The books were so powerful in their uh, vision that... Um, you know, this would just unfold, and I would be recognized as kind of a prophet of this uh, new religion. Well, what kinds of things were in the were in the book? I mean, looking back on it, was there anything that was what was really kind of the the message? Well, uh, I, I ultimately did have a chance to go back and look at it uh, several uh, once uh, in the, my Jungian analysis that I should also talk about in a, in a bit. Um, and then since then, you know, uh, uh, I've looked at it, and it's a very kind of 60s vision of people living together tribally and in integrated communities. And it was it's the kind of thing that led some people to found uh, communes, very much a similar kind of, I, you know, ideas that were kind of popping into a lot of people's minds. And and. You know, I think people, I I certainly have been struggling with, you know, how to live uh, closely with people in a very, uh, in a society that doesn't uh, really encourage that. And and looking into a co-housing community, my wife are involved in as a founding group uh, in a co-housing community. So, you know, I think there are, they were real breakthroughs in this experience and my own understanding of what my values are. I don't think it had any real universal breakthrough qualities at all. It's not something I would think about publishing or uh, trying to actually do in any uh, concrete way uh, that's described there. But it, it certainly was both my, it was also my spiritual awakening. I mean, I had prior to that really no, I paid no attention to spirituality. If somebody, if somebody brought up that whole area, I would just say, oh, I'm an agnostic, you know, and I don't really care very much about it anyway. Um, So the ideas in this book that you wrote, I mean, they had some real validity. It wasn't just a meaningless kind of thing that you did in the middle of the night. It had some real validity, but the real breakthrough wasn't like a world historic breakthrough. It was really a personal breakthrough that that you went went through. So what happened next? You you send it out and you sent copies to... um, your friends and relatives, and you you gave them out on the on the street, and then and then how did it? And you're you're sort of staying with your friends. You're not really working. You're kind of crashing on people's couches and things. And then then what happened? Well, uh, after about two months, I kind of came down from this, and uh, that's something that now I've been led to my subsequent work on spiritual emergencies because. I think that would happen to a lot more people if they were allowed to go through these experiences, you know, without getting medicated, without getting hospitalized. I mean, I was lucky, I think, that, you know, if I, this had happened to me on the East Coast, my parents probably would have tried to get me hospitalized. But since I was on the West Coast and they were on the East Coast and I was, you know, maintaining myself in a sense through my friends, uh, that um, 
I was allowed to go through this and let it be a kind of inner journey, you know, where I was kind of uh, exploring parts of myself and particularly this spiritual part that I had been ignoring. I guess John Perry is a union analyst who worked with people having first psychotic breaks, setting up a home for them uh, where they could go through it without medication. He has written about it in a book called Far Side of Madness, and there's actually some, a number of interviews up uh, online with him that you can find on, you know, by Googling John Perry. Yeah, I think it was called a Diabasis House in San Francisco. It, it, Is that right? That's right. Um, so I was basically provided with that kind of environment, and he coined the term uh, compensatory psychosis. In other words, if a person has really been ignoring one important dimension of the personality, they might have a psychotic episode that would kind of flip them over into an extreme version of that. And then when they kind of reintegrate, it's a more uh, inter- it becomes more integrated into the whole self or personality. So you say you came uh, down after about two months. Did you yeah. did you like crash into a depression or did you just sort of like have kind of more of a gentle landing where the whole experience had kind of just played itself out and you just went all the way through it? Well, that was in a way the beginning of uh, a number of other experiences that uh, uh, were very, um, have been a very, played a very significant uh, role in my development, which was that I did, I just, afterwards, I was very embarrassed, you know, how could I have done something so foolish? Um, And uh, started to have regrets about, you know, dropping out of Harvard and uh, and just questioning everything. Um, And I did become very depressed and even got to the point, I I had uh, an illness the, from uh, when I was uh, about 13 that I had surgery for called Crohn's disease, which affects the intestines, and I had a recurrence of that. And uh, there were times during uh, I was living alone uh, in a cottage in Cape Cod that I had uh, with my parents' summer cottage, but I just moved there to have a place to live. And um, uh, during that time, uh, I had some pain medication from a free clinic uh, for the Crohn's because there's not much you can do in terms of treatment. Um, and uh, at sometimes at night, I actually saw what I took to be my own skeleton kind of hovering above myself and seriously considered taking the pain medication to commit suicide. Wow. And you were you had gone back to the East Coast now. What kinds of connections did you have with your friends and community that was supporting you when you were in this more high, expanded state when, when you started to go down into this depression? Well, in a sense, because of, I felt that I had kind of leeching on my friends and not, you know, uh, I mean, I didn't feel that strongly, but I was, I was, I was yeah, I felt like I was aware enough all of a sudden to think that I shouldn't just be crashing with everybody. Um, so then I moved to my parents' cottage because it was really a summer cottage and only used and rented out during the summer. But, you know, I moved there in March and, um, I mean, it was a part of what I was doing there was trying to unravel and start to understand this experience. Uh, and I started to read Jung and I started to read, uh, Joseph Campbell and, uh, a very influential book I read was, uh, by Richard Buck, who was a Canadian psychiatrist who wrote about cosmic consciousness, which is a term I'm sure many people are familiar with but may not know its origins, which was from his research showing these experiences that people, and he started with Buddha and he included Christ, uh, and then he included Walt Whitman and his own personal experience, which got him involved in this, uh, but he documented these kinds of visionary uh, experiences in, in these people. So I started to think that what I had had was, a, you know, at least it validated what I had in the sense that it made it sound like it was a, you know, positive, good experience. I started to figure out what I was going to do with my life, but it, it kind of 
gave me a positive frame for the experience. Um, was that how you kind of pulled yourself out of the, the, the suicidal depression that you were facing when you were on the, uh, in, in Cape Cod? Well, the thing that actually I think was a, the turning point was uh, taking a walk on a beach at the time. I, I was right there near the beach, and I did used to go on a walk uh, every, almost every day, you know, if it wasn't like pouring rain or something. Um, and while I was walking on the beach, you know, all by myself around the bay, the Wellfleet Bay, beautiful bay, um, all of a sudden I heard a voice, and I really, I literally turned around thinking there was somebody there, and there's absolutely nobody there. And the voice, and I, I only heard it that one time, but it said, become a healer. And, I mean, wow. It, this was totally puzzled by that. And and yet it became kind of a mantra. Um, and I started to kind of, you know, go into this, treat it almost like a koan, you know, what does it mean to become a healer? Does it mean, you know, to go to medical school? Does it mean uh, to study herbs? Does it mean to, uh, you know, uh, become a yoga teacher? You know, wh what did it mean to become a healer? Because you had me? been in Harvard, but you were studying anthropology or you weren't studying anything around psychology or, or medical or healthcare practice or anything like that. So, um, th you know, I just began to experiment with different things, you know, to, to try to, you know, I actually took a course in herbs and took a class in yoga and also participated in an encounter group. I decided I should try an encounter group. I actually really, uh, the whole encounter group, things about sharing about people and gestalt and psychodrama that was part of that group, uh, was really, to me, uh, eye-opening and really it felt like a real cutting edge to me. And I ended up uh, deciding to pursue becoming a, uh, what was at the time called social therapist. And that meant you could do things like lead groups at hospitals and at uh, and uh, I, I also got some more training and ended up doing a lot of gestalt groups and psychodrama groups. And if you're just tuning in, this is uh, Madness Radio. We're interviewing uh, David Lukoff, who is a clinical psychologist and a professor at the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology in Palo Alto, California. And he is working on bringing uh, issues of spirituality into mental health and into clinical practice in the mental health system. Now, David, for people who don't know what an encounter group is or what Gestalt is, tell us a little bit about what that was about and, and why were you so interested in it from this kind of spiritual perspective that you had developed? Well, what I think I was still in this phase of trying to figure out who I was and uh, who I wanted to be and become. And so I found uh, the whole encounter process of people uh, sharing openly with each other about how they perceive each other, what they like, what they don't like, well, what if they're sexually attracted to uh, that person. I mean, things that I would have never openly talked about. And I started to find that um, uh, there was a lot of value to that. Um, and... Um, also, a theme in a couple of relationships that I'd had with women was around uh, their saying that I didn't know how to talk about my emotions, my feelings. And here I was discovering what that really meant and the value of it. So that's why I decided that, you know, to pursue that rather than yoga or the study of herbs or something. I mean, all, both of which are, you know... Uh, I do respect and even partake of to some degree, but it felt to me like this was really the cutting edge, this, this kind of exploration. And the psychodrama and gestalt are techniques whereby you're able to kind of uh, isolate a part of your uh, way of being in the world, your personality, you know, the way your parents, you hear your parents' voices in your head sometimes kind of, and sometimes it's other mentors, and sometimes it's media, but there's we're often guided, in a sense, by uh, some images we have of things. And to be able to explore that and really understand 
uh, you know, how that plays out in my life, uh, you know, I, I found very um, valuable. And I enjoyed facilitating that in other people because part of that role. Was this the beginning of what led you to, to ultimately go on to become a clinical psychologist and a professor and to work with people as a therapist? I got to graduate school and it was very traditional. You know, I learned about psychological testing and uh, uh, I also took my first class in psychopathology and it was during that class that I really kind of learned that what I had experienced would have been uh, diagnosed in the DSM-2, which was the existing DSM at that time in, in the mid-70s, uh, I would have been diagnosed with uh, an acute schizophrenic reaction, a type of schizophrenia. And um, at that point, I became very, um, again, kind of embarrassed or, or actually felt that really uh, my uh, professional credibility would be uh, in some way diminished if that came out. In fact, I was worried, you know, uh, if it got out, if I talked about it, you know, in a graduate psychology program, uh, would that, uh, or in my subsequent internships or anything like that, you know, I, I really felt like that could really um, result in problems in my program. And that totally changed my perspective on it. <laughs> because part of what I was doing was learning, you know, how to be a, a clinical psychologist and taking on that world view. Part of clinical tra psychology training involves, uh, traditionally, not everybody does this nowadays, but uh, spending a year working at a psychiatric hospital. Um, it was there that I, you know, started to encounter a number of people who had had uh, similar experiences, really. I mean, you know, similar in certainly that they believed that they were Christ or Mary or had some... Uh, special mission or, you know, something like that. I had actually gone to graduate school, as I mentioned, to pursue uh, becoming kind of a, a growth group leader, you know, leading gestalt and psychodrama groups and things like that. But while I was working at this hospital, I found that I had this kind of unique ability to connect with these people, um, that um, I would be able to uh, really uh, accept that they were... Uh, doing, uh, that their experiences had some validity. And I actually formed groups where patients um, could talk about these experiences. Uh, there was one I actually co-led with a, um, a rabbi, uh, and it really focused on patients' uh, religious hallucinations and delusions. And I also led uh, groups at the hospital. Um, after the... After after my internship, I actually became a psychologist at that hospital and led groups on uh, growth and schizophrenia, uh, where um, I would uh, present the idea that, uh, well, I would describe, you know, in one group, I would, in that, in that group, I would uh, bring in accounts of Native Americans, uh, vision quests of shamanic uh, initiatory crises. I would bring in... Uh, work of Van Gogh and uh, um, you know, then have uh, the patients in the group uh, describe how their experiences were similar to those, you know, really validating them. So the idea is that you um, really were looking at what you went through as really kind of a common, maybe not common, but a shared human experience that many people throughout history and different cultures actually go through a similar kind of spiritual awakening process, is that right? Right, and that uh, if people who had had those experiences, instead of having them uh, pathologized, you know, had them validated, uh, that they could actually um, uh, grow from that experience, benefit from it. And that's kind of exactly what I'm doing today with the work with the California Department of Mental Health, is encouraging people, supporting them uh, to uh, make use of these kinds of uh, uh, religious experiences that they've had uh, as a foundation for their uh, development of uh, their spiritual journey. And you talked about the idea of, of an initiation crisis, and that's a common uh, thread that goes through a lot of different cultures around the world that someone goes into a, a real 
a, an illness period or they go into some kind of crisis and they have this kind of spiritual experience and then on the other side of it that's when they discover their calling as a healer and it sounds like that you sort of fit that that pattern and have you seen that in other people as well that that um, you know they may have been told or the people around them see what they're going through as purely delusional or negative but actually they end up later down the road it ends up guiding them to becoming a healer or in some form or other uh, yes. Um, when I have given talks and when I've given um, workshops related to th- these topics, uh, there are often many people uh, in the audience, in the participants of the workshop, who have had very similar experiences to my own. Yeah, um, people who listen to the radio show also know that some of my own personal experiences have a lot of parallels to what you're talking about here. David, let me ask you just a kind of a side question, which is that um, how... Um, frequent is it, do you think, that someone takes a psychedelic like LSD and it's not so much the drug experience, but somehow something gets triggered or unlocked or or they start to really start to take spirituality seriously, whereas before they hadn't. And I, I know that uh, we've talked about this on the show before, that a lot of the, of the teachers today um, who teach Buddhism in the United States Many of them actually got started on the spiritual path through a similar kind of a drug experience or they discovered things through LSD or something, maybe not as dramatically as you did, but that was kind of the starting point for them becoming later very serious spiritual practitioners as well as healers. Yes, and actually there's research to support that. There was an article published in the Journal of Transpersonal Psychology on the Nyingma meditation uh, center participants, people who were uh, living in that community and so on. And um, around three-quarters of them had prior uh, psychedelic drug experiences that uh, led them into their meditation practice. And so I do think LSD and other psychedelic drugs have served as these kinds of... uh, um, openings for people, especially in, in terms of spiritual awakening. Now tell us about, you You mentioned working with the California Department of Mental Health. Tell us about how you were able to get um, a new diagnosis into the, the DSM. I'm not a big fan of the DSM in, in general, but it sounds like um, a lot of people who would have just been given a schizophrenia diagnosis or just treated um, as a pathology, um, now that there's this new diagnosis in the DSM, there's maybe a different pathway that clinicians might look at for how to help them. So tell us about that process and how you were able to to do that, because you really led that. You really led that effort. Is that right? Well, uh, it was a team effort. There were uh, two psychiatrists that I worked closely with during this time. Uh, the story actually starts with. Um, my uh, work with the Spiritual Emergency Network, which then became the Spiritual Emergence Network, it was founded by Stan and Christina Groff in 1980. And uh, their uh, objective was to create a network of people who could work with people having spiritual crises, you know, some like my own, some related to... Uh, things like uh, kundalini uh, that uh, can get raised by people doing yogic practices, sometimes without uh, a teacher or supervision, but just from like a DVD, you can do those kinds of things. Or qigong or meditation practice. Sometimes people have experiences where they're in an altered state, kind of disconnected from everyday consensual reality, may have unusual beliefs, and so on. And yet these are, you know, time-limited experiences that uh, can be uh, worked with. Often, you know, spiritual teachers know exactly how to handle these experiences. Jack Kornfield has written uh, about uh, somebody who um, uh, was in a meditation retreat that he was leading, and in the middle of the silent retreat, you know, kind of jumped, barged into the dining hall, 
and started to you know execute karate uh, moves and uh, tell people that he could see their auras and you know it was just uh, you know, totally you know inappropriate disconnected from the whole uh, uh, process now in other uh, meditation centers when somebody has done that and uh, also growth centers like uh, Esalen Institute, often they'll just call 911 and have the person taken to the local psychiatric hospital. That's actually exactly what was even happening at Esalen, and that's why Stan and Christina formed the Spiritual uh, Emergence Network, was to find alternatives to doing that. Um, so I got involved with this. It certainly you know, was, a con- you know, from my own experience, made a lot of sense. Um, and there were a number of conferences. Uh, Esalen held a uh, kind of a, a working conference on this topic uh, that I actually led. And um, at a conference in 1989, uh, I was on the organizing committee, and after the conference, which had 500 uh, participants, um, we started to talk about, well, how would we get this even, you know, more recognized uh, so that spiritual emergence uh, can be a focus of uh, clinical attention in some ways, um, that uh, we decided the best way to get it out into the world would be to have a DSM category for spiritual emergency. And Francis Liu, uh, professor of psychiatry at UCSF Medical School, and Robert Turner, a psychiatrist uh, now in private practice uh, in San Francisco, uh, and I set out to uh, do this, create or get a DSM category accepted, and you know, it seemed very kind of uh, far-fetched, but we decided to um, do it. It was a several-year process of uh, reviewing the literature. Um, I, I should mention that um, I've, I also, during the uh, in 1980s, published about five case studies of people who had experiences uh, similar to my own in a way that also, uh, one is actually about a woman who who got hospitalized, went to a day treatment center, and then went on to become a licensed uh, marriage and family therapist. And I interviewed her and got her experience published in a journal that is distributed to all psychiatrists in the American Psychiatric Association as a way to get kind of, again, this... Uh, perspective out into the, you know, recognized. So uh, we re- reviewed literature, not, you know, uh, including a number of case studies, as well as some surveys that showed that um, people do bring religious and spiritual issues into therapy, um, and also surveys showing that uh, psychiatrists and psychologists and social workers and so on are not given any professional training in, in religion and spirituality or how to work with religious and spiritual uh, issues in therapy. And, and that was eventually, the DSM was changed, and in the revision now they actually do have an official DSM diagnosis for spiritual or religious problem, which is quite a quite an accomplishment considering how elaborate their bureaucracy and how many hoops you must have to jump through to get that to happen, all the politics and the things that are going on behind the scenes to actually get that successful. Um, David, we don't have a lot of time, but I just wanted to ask you, um, are you hopeful for this continuing to progress in the future? I know you're working with the California Department of Mental Health, that you're also working with the consumer survivor recovery movement. Do you really feel like there's a, a change in the culture happening, and do you see the mental health system evolving more in a, in a way that's going to be more open to the kind of perspective that you're presenting? Well, uh, 
I do think there is a, a kind of a global phenomenon of uh, a spiritual awakening, people becoming more and more interested in spirituality. I know that the number of uh, transpersonal associations around the world has just been uh, expanding uh, over the last 15 years with new transpersonal associations recently formed um, in Korea and Lithuania. There are now 27 different international transpersonal associations and uh, uh, ATP, the Association for Transpersonal Psychology, which I'm co-president of, had a conference in India in this past January, January 2008, that had 450 people from over 40 different countries. So I do think uh, there is a increasing interest in uh, spirituality. Uh, in, and I use the term spirituality to represent something that's more universal and shared and uh, tolerant and accepting of all different uh, religious and spiritual paths. And I, I'm optimistic about that happening. Now, in California, the unique thing that's happened is that um, uh, California voters passed a special tax on millionaires and that tax has generated uh, a significant amount of money for uh, the development of programs in uh, mental health, and, which is what they're, this is targeted for. It must be used for, for this purpose. Actually, half goes to children's mental and physical health, and half goes to adult mental health. Um, so within that, uh, uh, there's now this money for which programs can apply. And so I've been involved here in California with a group of uh, consumers and religious professionals and uh, people working in county mental health, and many of these roles overlap. Um, we've been meeting for the past two years, um, in, and pretty much monthly, uh, sometimes by phone, sometimes face-to-face, -face, and are now... Uh, being recognized by the California Department of Mental Health, um, and are, uh, we have submitted a grant proposal for $310,000 to develop uh, innovative spiritual approaches in recovery programs around the state of California. So I feel like I'm now being given, you know, an opportunity to kind of put a lot of this into, you know, uh, mainstream clinical practice in that area. David, we, we're about out of time. Just give us some, some contact information. If people want to find out more about this perspective and your work, how could they get in touch with you and what are maybe some websites that they could check out? Well, uh, I do maintain a website called the Spiritual Competency Resource Center, uh, I have a number of articles of mine up there, including, for example, the, there's one on the history of this DSM category and the politics that were involved in that and so on. I'm actually starting to put up my own podcasts on that site as well. Great. What's the uh, web address for that? It's www.spiritualcompetency, all one word, dot com. David Lukoff, thank you so much for joining us today on uh, Madness Radio. Well, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Um, you've been listening to an interview with David Lukoff. He is a clinical psychologist and professor of psychology at the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology in Palo Alto, California. He is the co-author of the DSM-4 category, Religious or Spiritual Problem. That's about all the time we have this week on Madness Radio. Thanks a lot for tuning in. You've been listening to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health. Madness Radio broadcasts every Tuesday, 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern on Pacifica Affiliates, WXOJLPFM, Northampton, Massachusetts, and KWMD, Kasilof, and Anchorage, Alaska. Produced by peer-run mental health communities, freedom-center.org and theicarusproject.net. Listen to our internet stream, podcasts, and show archives at madnessradio.net. 
If you have an idea for a story or guest on Madness Radio, to help us get broadcast on a station near you, or if you just want to share what's in your head, contact radio at madnessradio.net.